In the northern Iraqi town of Amrli, residents were under siege from ISIS. They feared a massacre. But in recent days, the siege was broken. Iraq's president acknowledges a combination of U.S. airstrikes and Iranian-backed Shiite militias on the ground drove ISIS away. Is there any cooperation or coordination between the U.S. and Iran against ISIS? We do not coordinate military action or share intelligence with Iran and have no plans to do so. An Iranian official denies a BBC report saying Iran's supreme leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, approved cooperation between his forces and the Americans against ISIS. Specifically, the report says, Khamenei sanctioned General Qasem Soleimani, the shadowy head of the Quds Force of the Revolutionary Guard, to work with U.S. forces. Soleimani may look like George Clooney, but analysts say a better Hollywood comparison would be Don Corleone. He's evidently a rather mild-mannered man, uh, but he has done a very effective job in organizing the most brutal thugs uh, that the Islamic Republic has. This photo, posted on Twitter by a group called Digital Resistance, is described to be of Soleimani on the ground in Amerli around the time of that siege. CNN cannot independently verify that. Qasem Soleimani would be among the strangest bedfellows America's ever had. As soon as you sit down with him, though, you're sitting down with someone who's got the blood of Americans on his hands. U.S. officials believe during the Iraq war, Soleimani's units provided Iraqi insurgents with a lethal weapon against American troops. It was his Quds Force which provided these very advanced explosive devices, and really it's a misnomer to call them improvised explosive devices, that uh, penetrated the armor on American uh, vehicles, and as a result, killed an awful lot of Americans. Despite their mutual hatred of ISIS, other reasons why a U.S.-Iranian alliance may not work? Let's remember, we want Bashar al-Assad out. Iran is a long-standing supporter of Assad. We want a more inclusive, inclusive government in Baghdad. Iran would prefer a Shia government. There is also the matter of Qasem Soleimani's dangerous reach beyond the Middle East. U.S. Treasury officials say he was involved in a notorious plot on American soil overseeing Quds Force officers who in 2011 tried and failed to assassinate Saudi Arabia's ambassador to the U.S. at that place you see there, Washington's upscale Cafe Milano. Our next guest supports a broad coalition to fight against groups like ISIS. He says the West should not rule out, including Iran, Saudi Arabia, Russia, even the Syrian regime of Bashar al-Assad. Sir William Patey is a former British ambassador to Iraq and Saudi Arabia. He joins us now live from London. Mr. Ambassador, thanks so much for being with us. How far do you think it should go? How, how, who, sh who all should be included in this fight against ISIS? Well, I think anyone who has an interest in defeating ISIS and the uh, different coalition partners will have different roles. I think one of the important things is that you need to separate ISIS from the broad Sunni community. So it would be very important to have Saudi Arabia and Jordan and mainstream Sunni countries involved in this because unless you can separate ISIS from the mass of the Sunnis, then it will be very difficult to defeat them. You also need to talk to Iran. Iran has a role to play, can play a positive role in influencing the Iraqi government. But the Iraqi government needs to be a broad-based government which needs to reach out to the Sunnis of Iraq and convince them that they have a place in Iraq. So each part of a, of a complex coalition will have a different role to play. But let me get you to the, to the tough line in that theory, which is, what, are you going to, are you going to cooperate with Bashar al-Assad, who arguably got the ball rolling for ISIS I I inside Syria. Are, are you going to cuddle up to him in order to get at ISIS? I don't think you can cuddle up to Assad. He's played a very dangerous game. He nurtured ISIS in the, uh, in the initial phases. And you want to be careful in cuddling up to Assad if you alienate the uh, Sunnis of Syria. But you may want to talk to elements of the Assad regime. You may want to revisit the idea of elements of the Assad regime being uh, coming to terms with the uh, Sunni opposition, the FSA. And, of course, we have to decide how, how much we are prepared to do as a Western alliance to support the uh, FSA and the SNC in their battle because they're being squeezed on two fronts by, uh, by Assad and by ISIS. So it's a very complex situation, and you may have to consider things that were unthinkable two months ago may become more, uh, more, more into the consideration. Well, thinking about what we do, I, I think you'll agree from what you're saying, is so much more important than just doing anything in order to achieve 
our goals. And a lot of people look at the rise of ISIS right alongside regional concerns about Iran's advanced role, the involvement of Hezbollah, a pro-Iranian militia based in Lebanon, fighting on the side of Bashar al-Assad. The Sunnis have no doubt from the Gulf to uh, Saudi Arabia been involved in encouraging and enlisting the help of ISIS, and including right in Iraq, where it's believed that former army generals invited them in. Well, I think you highlight the complexity of this. If the Sunni population as a whole thinks that they're fighting a Shia alliance designed to limit their influence, then they're going to turn to ISIS. What we have to do is to convince people uh, that uh, what, is, what is on offer is a coexistence between Sunnis and Shia. Uh, and we need to convince the Sunnis that ISIS is not the, is not the solution. And that involves getting Iran in a, in a dialogue, not conceding to Iran... Uh, their their aims in the Middle East, but at least you get them being more positive than they are at the moment because we have to uh, somehow get this, uh, lessen this Sunni-Shia split because that will play into the hands of ISIS. And that's important that we talk to Jordan, we talk to Saudi Arabia, we listen to what they have to say, uh, we listen to uh, the, uh, the, the, the Sunnis in Lebanon and in the Gulf and and together work out how we devise a strategy to combat ISIS. This is not a short term. There's no, there's no quick fix here. It's, some, it's going to require quite a lot of engagement over an extended period of time. Around the world tonight and the hunt for ISIS, the terrorists behind those gruesome killings in this evening, you're about to see what could be a U.S. drone flying right over that key town in Syria. Just as President Obama says of ISIS, he wants them destroyed, dismantled and defeated. ABC's chief investigative correspondent, Brian Ross, with the image of that drone and the new scrutiny tonight. An American from Michigan. Are his video messages inspiring some to join the enemy? Today, over the ISIS stronghold of Raqqa, Syria, a sign of the battle that could be coming. Activists in Syria posted this photo of what they said was an unarmed U.S. drone. The ISIS side posted its own photo of the surveillance craft circling the city. The U.S. is urgently seeking intelligence on potential military targets and on any sign of the two American hostages still held by ISIS. Where are they and are there any rescue attempts that are possible? The U.S. is also searching for some other Americans in Syria, those like this former college student from Boston who have turned on their country to join ISIS. The jihadist recruitment pipeline to Syria from the U.S. and Europe is of huge concern to law enforcement authorities. Why did this happen to us? And now they are closely monitoring the preaching of this charismatic Muslim cleric living in Dearborn, Michigan, Ahmad Jabril, who invokes the history of great Islamic warriors. These were real men who were there to give their jugular veins for the sake of Allah. And the Jabril's internet videos are credited with inspiring an estimated 60% of the Western recruits to jihad in Syria, according to a study done at King's College in London. They were regularly listening to his sermons, and they were clearly influenced by him. Jabril, who spent five years in prison on federal fraud charges, does not specifically urge his followers to violence, but says the U.S. wants Muslims to die. They're waiting for the maximum amount of Sunni death, yes, to pleasure and delight their hearts. He's feeding the narrative without actually making an open call for violence. And then when it's time to convince them to fight, you're already halfway there. We tried to find Jabril at a relative's home in Dearborn, Michigan, Michigan, but no one would come out to talk with us. His lawyer said she had no comment on her client's activities, David. All right, Brian, thank you for your reporting all week long. Now, a spokesman for Iraq's most respected Shia cleric, Ayatollah Ali Sistani, has urged the parliament to investigate the massacre of Iraqi soldiers at Camp Spiker. In the incident at Camp Spiker, hundreds of our country's sons were killed in a brutal way and in complicated circumstances. Many of them are still missing and some may be still alive. The families of the victims have demanded that the Iraqi parliament investigate precisely what happened. We hope that the parliament can arrive at the truth through its own methods, as we emphasize that the investigation of this crisis must be confined to limits that include only those who were responsible for this crime. Ahmed al-Safi said the parliament should punish all those who committed the crime at the military base north of Baghdad in June. 
El Safi made the statement after new evidence revealed that the ISIL Takfiri terrorists murdered between 560 and 770 Iraqi soldiers captured at Camp Spiker. The massacre was one of the worst conducted by ISIL. ISIL militants have seized large swaths of northern Iraq and Syria as part of their efforts to establish a so-called Islamic Caliphate. To discuss the situation further, let's go to Idaho and talk to Mark Glenn, political commentator. Welcome to the program. So, Mr. Glenn, first of all, just how well are the Iraqi forces addressing the Takfiri threat? Well, the Iraqi forces, uh, of course, uh, have their hands tied already. Let's not forget that Iraq is a, uh, a destroyed country. So, you know, we're basically talking about uh, an army and a political system here uh, that is being forced to do this. Uh, with two hands tied behind its back. That's number one. Number two, uh, the ISIL militants are backed by the most uh, ruthless and well-equipped military uh, and political machinery in the world. And of course, I'm talking about the United States and the West. And so what more can the Iraqis do? Uh, the, the slaughter of 800 uh, Iraqi soldiers uh, certainly is uh, a, a terrible thing. Uh, it has got to be an absolute uh, shock to the system in terms of uh, the country. Uh, certainly the families, but but again, we have to remember here that, that ISIL is being uh, fed, is being trained, is being uh, staffed with uh, with people and logistics that basically have made it almost an unstoppable force uh, in the region because it's backed up by the United States. This is exactly what the United States uh, needs to have happen in order to further destabilize Iraq and then eventually Syria, and then uh, if they get their way, uh, Iran as well. And why is it that the U.S. has just recently acknowledged that ISIL is really a threat, at least on the surface, if we take it? And in turn, what could one expect from Washington? Well, I think what has happened here, let's face it, the United States is very good at marketing. Uh, and they understand that when one product has gotten old and no longer is being bought uh, by uh, consumers, that they have to come up with a new and improved version of it. And so al-Qaeda has basically gone out the door, and now they need to rebrand Islamic terrorism into something uh, new and improved, and that is exactly what ISIL and ISIS are for. They are here to rejuvenate uh, all of the anti-Islamic uh, hysteria that exists in America and the West uh, as a precursor to launching uh, more aggressive actions uh, wherever they have decided that it's going to be. This ISIL thing is going to be around for a while. We're going to be getting daily reports uh, here in the West about the latest atrocities that they have committed. And then, of course, uh, unfortunately, which will will finally uh, rear its head in the United States in the form of some horrible terrorist attack that will be blamed on them and which will be used as a precursor uh, for, again, launching military actions, uh, sadly, probably against Iran. And very briefly, how much will this Takfiri threat spread? Will it be stopped in Iraq and will it, or, or will it spread to other countries on the same scale? Well, that depends on uh, some of the, pl the players in the region. Certainly, Iran can do something to, to rein these uh, wild animals in. Uh, but Iran cannot do it alone. They, they need the help of the Russians. They need the help of the Chinese. Uh, they need uh, the entire international community that is not under the thumb of international Zionism to step forward and to lend their support to this endeavor. Otherwise, Iran's going to be doing this alone. Uh, and I don't think that Iran has the resources to do it because they're just backed, as I said, uh, by the most vicious military and political machinery that uh, human history has ever seen. All right. Mark Lem, political commentator from Idaho. Thanks for your thoughts there, sir.